So the distributive property um, is a special property of math used when you have a situation of a number multiplying by a, an entire expression where we have a variable and another number or maybe multiple variables. There's lots, lots of ways to use the distributive property. It's normally written like this. You normally have the number in front. Occasionally they write the number behind, but it's basically the same thing. So with the distributive property, um, it's basically just multiplication. You're just multiplying more than one time. You have to multiply the outside number by both numbers inside. You have the five multiplied by the X, and you also have the five multiplied by the negative two. So when I do distributive property, instead of just leaving the minus sign there, I usually do this number multiplied by the entire sign, whether it's a positive or negative, and then it tells me what sign to write as the answer. So when we multiply, five times X is just five X. You can't multiply the number times the X. The only multiplication that actually happens is you have the five times a one, which is still five. But most of the time we just know five times X is five X. And then we do the multiplication here, five times negative two is negative 10. So most of the time, people don't even write out this middle step. It's just to show you where this information is coming from, where we got the five X, where we got the minus 10. Since five times negative two was negative, we keep it as a minus 10. So even if there's more variables or more numbers on the inside, No matter what's going on inside the parentheses, we multiply by everything inside. So even if there's three things, when we do distributive property, we take the outside number and multiply it by every single term. Negative three times the two X squared. And again, most of the time you just do the multiplication in your head or with a calculator. You don't have to write this step out unless it helps. Everyone's different, so some might like having it written out, some might not. So then we do the negative three times the negative seven X and we do the negative three times the positive four. Negative three times positive two. This time we do some multiplication here with the variable. So we get negative six X squared. Negative three times a negative seven is positive 21. And this time we have our variables that are going to multiply as well. And we have X times X. It's actually more like addition. You count how many there are and that tells you the exponent. Since there were two of the same thing, this is X squared. And then we do the last one, a negative three times a positive four is a negative 12. Um, I can't remember if the pre-algebra distributive property does this or not, but some of the distributive property lessons also try to use the distributive property to um, make multiplying two numbers together a little bit easier. So if we were doing 98 times 12, that's a hard thing to do in your head. Let's say you don't have a calculator, but 98 is pretty close to 100. So instead of writing this as 98, we're going to be a little bit tricky. We're gonna say 100 minus two, that's the same thing as 98. And then we're still multiplying by 12. If we do that little trick, now we can still use the distributive property. Notice this time the 12's on the right side, but you still distribute the same way. 12 times 100 and 12 times the negative two. 
And now we can do this without a calculator. 12 times 100, you really just do 12 times 1 is 12, and then keep the two zeros. So that's 1,200. And then 12 times negative 2 is negative 24. And then we combine them back together um, to get our final answer. 1,200 minus 24 is 1,176. So you can use that little technique if you don't have a calculator nearby. It can help you um, possibly do some multiplication problems in your head if you don't have a calculator. Um, so we had a couple other people join. Thank you, Donna and Leticia. I'm glad you're here. Do you have um, any specific questions from your math courses that you might want to discuss today? If not, I have some other topics prepared, but if you have specific questions, you can either unmute yourself and just ask me, or you can send me a chat message. Um, if you send a chat message, you have to find the chat area. There's on mine, it's a three dot menu where I have to go to more and actually access the chat. So if you have questions, let me know. And since you weren't here um, at the beginning, this is the math live study session. So we're going to be going over math topics only. My name is April Barton. I may or may not be your actual teacher. Um, every student goes to a different math teacher, but you can always ask any of us um, questions about your math classes. So I don't see any messages so far. So let's go ahead and cover. Uh, I am not in this class yet. Do I still get extra credit for it is a question. I am pretty sure you do still get the five points or 5% extra credit on an assignment um, just for going to a session. So I'll make sure to let your academic coach know that you're here. Um, and I'm pretty sure you do still get that extra credit. Okay, so um, let's cover another math topic. I'll keep an eye out for questions. Feel free to ask questions anytime. So one of the topics in algebra that you might see we have a whole bunch of people from different classes, so this may or may not be specifically relevant to you. But let's go over an algebra topic now because we did do a pre-algebra topic. Um, so one of the topics from algebra is order of operations. Order of operations is always a good topic, and maybe we'll cover some equations as well after that. And again, if you have a specific subject you want to know more about, let me know at any time. So order of operations is the order you do math problems in. If there's no equal sign and you only have numbers and you need to simplify those, then we use the order of operations. Usually we have this acronym to help us remember them. Um, some people say the little rhyme, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Um, or you, some people just say PEMDAS. That tells us the order to do math problems in when we're simplifying. So P stands for parentheses. E stands for exponents. MD stands for multiply and divide. Um, and that's a little tricky because if you have multiply and divide going on, a lot in a problem. You actually do this from left to right. So it doesn't necessarily have to be do multiplication before division. If we had 10 divided by 2 times, sorry, that was written kind of funny. Well, let me fix that. Divided by 2 times 8. Even though M comes before D in PEMDAS. 
when we have division and multiplication only, just go left to right. If you do the multiplication first, it's actually going to give the wrong answer. We have to do 10 divided by 2 first, and then multiply by the 8. So just watch out for that with multiplication and division. They're actually kind of one group. Same thing with addition and subtraction. They're also one group. So if subtraction comes first, that's fine. Still go from left to right. 10 minus 2 is 8, plus 8 is 16. So let's do a more complicated order of operations problem. Let's say we have a lot more going on. So let's say we have 5 multiplied by 3 to the 4th divided by 9 plus 5 times 2 minus 4. So order of operations says do whatever is in the parentheses first. We have a long list of numbers in here, so we do inside here first. And inside this, we need to do exponents first. So when we use our exponents. Our exponent is this little number up above. The 4 up above the 3 is an exponent, and it tells you how many times to multiply a number together. And one of the most common mistakes you'll see is 3 multiplied by 4, but really what you want to do is 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. 3 multiplied together four times. I'm going to pull up a calculator really quick. Um, you can use any kind of calculator for your course. It can be a handheld separate calculator, it can be an online calculator, it can be your computer calculator, whatever you have access to. So if we multiply three together four times, we get 81. So next inside our parentheses, we're going to be doing the multiply divide stuff. So when there's both of these going on, we can do both at the same time, as long as we're going from left to right. So we divide our 81 divided by 9 first. And we can also at the same time do our positive 5 times 2. Now, technically, the 5 is also multiplying. This is 5 times the parentheses. But order of operations says to do inside the parentheses first. That has to happen first, and then we'll do that multiplication at the end. So now we're to add and subtract inside the parentheses. And again, just go left to right. 9 plus 10 is 19. Then minus the 4 is 15. So now we have our parentheses taken care of. We can do anything outside the parentheses. Um, if you had extra, let's say on the end we had plus 4 squared, if you had exponents outside the parentheses, you'd still go in the correct order for order of operations. But we only have one thing left to do, which is multiply. 5 times the 15. Oops. 5 times the 15 is 75. Now, if you know how to use a calculator well, and you're familiar with whatever calculator you're using, you can actually usually plug in 
an entire problem. Um, you just have to be careful. And it's hard to describe all the ways to use a calculator because every calculator is a little bit different. But I'll show you on the Google calculator. So we basically, when you type it into a calculator, just start left to right. So we'd have five parentheses, three to the fourth. So on the Google calculator to get an exponent is this XY button. That's a common button to get your exponent. You might also see a button that looks, it's called the caret key, kind of looks like the top of a triangle. So you could do three caret key four, depending on your calculator. So three to the fourth divided by nine plus five times two minus four. And then end your parenthesis. So if you type it in correctly, then it'll just pop out the answer. Do you have to be careful though? If you don't type it in correctly, um, it can really mess up your problem. So that's the basics of order of operations. Another big topic in algebra is equations. So equations, you're still trying to get one number as an answer, but this time we have an equal sign. So order of operations, there's no equal sign. You're just trying to simplify a whole bunch of numbers down to one number. Equations, we're trying to solve. We're trying to figure out what number could we put in that X spot and have it actually simplify out to an eight. So with our equations, we're gonna use a lot of opposite operations. So we need to make sure we know our opposites. So what is the opposite of addition? So just type your answer in, or you can unmute yourself and answer that way. What's the opposite of addition? Not seeing any responses yet. There we go, subtraction. That is correct. Um, and if you don't want everyone to see your messages, you can always switch it to private mode and then I will just get the messages. So we did get an answer. Opposite of addition is subtraction. The other one, main one is multiplication. And when I do multiplication, I use the dot. Um, Sometimes you start with multiplication and you use the little X to mean multiply. We don't want to do that anymore because now we're using the variable X. So instead of ever hit using the little X, we're going to always use the little dot. So if I do a little dot, it should be in the middle. The difference between five times two and 5.2 is where the dot is located. It'll be at the very bottom if it's a decimal, It'll be in between if it's multiply. So multiply, what's our opposite of multiplication? Good, division. So those are the main opposites we need to know. When we work with an equation, there are two sides. So what you do to one side must be done to the other side. Equations, you always have to follow that property of what you do to the left, you do to the right. And we choose what to do based on what's already there. I literally could do anything I wanted. If I wanted to add 70 
I could. It's not going to help me much, though. It's not going to change much in a way I want it to change. Our ultimate goal is to get x alone, but we can't do that unless we choose wisely when we choose our opposite. So we want to do the opposite of what's already there. So since this 5 is subtracting, we want to choose to add it. And what we do to one side, we do to the other. If I add 5 on the left, I have to add 5 on the right. We choose it that way because negative 5 plus 5 is 0. This is going to make it go away. Negative 5 plus a 5 always comes out as 0. We chose it because now we don't need that anymore. We've literally moved it to the other side. And on the other side, we actually do that addition. 8 plus 5 is 13. So now we need to figure out our next opposite. And it's a little bit trickier at this point. The 3 is touching the x. The 3 is touching the x, um, but we don't know what math operation is here. So when there's a number next to a letter, that actually means you are multiplying. We need to note that this is multiplication so that we can do the opposite operation. So the opposite of multiply is to divide. And this time again, we choose it because it's going to get rid of these numbers. Instead of making a zero, this time when we do three divided by three, it becomes a one. But when it's a number, next, number one next to the letter X, you can write it as just X. We just had a new person join us. Thanks for being here. Um, if you have questions, please let me know. If you're not currently asking a question, I'm going to ask you to keep yourself so we don't have as much background noise. So I'm going to mute, mute you really quick. If you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and actually. My bad. No problem. It happens all the time. That's something I explain pretty much every time. It's just hard if we have all all the people here um, unmuted, then there's a lot of background noise and there's already enough background noise at the office. Um, so we're going to finish solving this equation. The 3 over 3 just canceled. And then the 13 over 3, since I made this problem up off the top of my head, is going to come out as a weird decimal, 4.333. If you get any decimals, that's fine. You can get that answer. Usually, I will tell you where to round in the question. So let's say we have this and I say to round to the nearest tenth spot. What should our answer be if we round to the tenths? So if we round to the tenth spot, how should we write this decimal? Good. I got an answer. 4.3 only. The tenth spot is this number immediately after the decimal. And we have to decide, is that going to stay a 3 or go up to a 4? And the way we decide that is the number next to it on the right. Um, so that 3 is between 0 and 4, which means it stays the same. If the number next to it is between 5 and 9, it um, rounds up. So when you're solving equations, sometimes it's hard to have so much written down and so much going on. One way you can work with solving an equation is to still figure out what opposite you're going to do. 
but instead of writing it on both sides, you're just going to cross out what happens on the left and actually apply it on the right side. So on our left, we want to do the opposite of the plus four first. So what's the opposite of adding four? Sorry for the background noise. Every time someone graduates, we ring a bell. And so somebody just graduated. So opposite of adding four, what's the opposite of plus four? Good, got an answer again over chat. That is subtract four. So instead of writing it under both sides, I explained what happens and how it goes to zero. Basically what happens though is the plus four goes away. On the other side is where we actually do the subtraction. Seven minus four is three. So that can make it a little less confusing. You don't have as much going on by only writing it on the right side. Uh, next, we have divide by three. So our opposite is going to be to multiply. And division is one of the best ones to just only write it on the other side and to cancel this out. We know by doing the opposite, the divide by three is going to go away. So it just gets rid of the number on the left and we do the multiplication on the right. Um, and something to note, even though I've been saying left and right, they can switch this up. If I put seven on the left and the variable on the right, you still do the question the same way, just you always wanna move the stuff away from the X. So we're still gonna minus four, but now we put it on the left always put it on the opposite side. And we're still going to times by the three, but now we put it on the left. If you don't like it on the right, just switch it back. If it starts out seven equals x over three plus four, just switch it back over so that your x is on the left. It can make it easier if you get used to that pattern over and over again. So we've had some more people join. Um, do you guys have any uh, questions specifically from your math courses? If not, I can pick another topic. I have some prepared, but I wanted to see if you guys had any specific questions from your math courses. So keep an eye out for questions. Again, if you have a question and you just want to ask it, you can unmute yourself to ask. Um, so we've talked about equations. We talked about order of operations. Let's talk a little bit about some graphing. And if you do have a question specifically from your course, just let me know and we'll switch over to that. So when you graph a line, uh, we have to first know how to work in the coordinate plane. So in the coordinate plane, there's the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is usually X. Um, and see you later. Thanks for joining for a little bit. Glad you came and heard a little bit at least. So I was responding to a chat that said they were going to be leaving. Um, so on our coordinate plane, we have the x-axis, we have the y-axis. And so we always have two directions to move. We have the horizontal directions and the vertical. And to decide which direction to move, we need a coordinate. Every coordinate is written as x comma y. So if I had the coordinate negative 2 comma 1, we always start from the center to do our counting. And this is also called the origin. Got its own fancy special name. So negative 2 means count 
two spaces to the left. On the x-axis, right is positive, left is negative. Count two spaces to the left, but we still don't put our point because we've also got to go the y direction. In the y direction, the one is one space up. And that's our actual coordinate, negative two comma one. It's just about counting, but you just have to make sure you're counting in the correct order. So when we graph a line, we're going to have a whole bunch of coordinates that when connected together make an entire line. So there's a couple ways to graph a line. A line always has a y value and an x value. And when we graph it, you can either make a table or there's some specific information when your line's written this way. So if we make a table, you can make a table for any type of graph. When you make a table, we pick a few points and plug them in, and that'll give us what the shape of the graph is going to look like. So I'm going to pick negative 1, 0, and 1. When you pick those points, now you, at one at a time, you plug them in to get the y value. Instead of the letter x, we're going to replace it with the negative 1. And I usually put parentheses around it because we know this is 3 times x, and parentheses mean to multiply. So now we have to use the order of operation skills we learned before. We know we do multipli multiplication before we do subtraction. So 3 times negative 1 is negative 3 minus 1. And negative 3 minus 1 is a negative 4. So let me draw our graph up so we can get the picture of this line. Sorry, it always takes a second to draw out this coordinate plane. So a table is really just a whole lot of points. So this negative 1, negative 4 is a coordinate. It just looks a little different because they didn't put parentheses around it or a comma in between. So negative 1 means go left 1. X-axis is always left or right. And negative 4 means go down 4 from there. So there's our first point. We've got to find another point. So now we're going to plug in 0, and we follow the same order of operations. Multiplication first, 3 times 0 is 0, and subtraction second. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. Last one is a 1, 3 times 1 minus 1 still. We always go back to this original function when we're plugging in. 3 times 1 is 3, minus 1 is 2. So plotting our last two points, we have 0, negative 1. So if the first number is a 0, that means don't go left or right. So we stay in the center. And then the negative 1 for the y means move down one space. So then we have 1, 2, so we go right 1 this time, it's a positive 1, up 2. Once you have a couple points, you can draw your line. My graph is not the best. When you draw it by hand, you might be a little bit off. I was going to see if I could adjust the line. Just pretend the line goes through all the points. So that's one way to graph a line. A second way is to know some information about something called the slope and the y-intercept. So this only works if your equation has that y alone. We're going to use the same equation, but now I'm going to show you a second way to graph it.
I'm going to draw out the coordinate plane really quick. So, when we graph this, we need the number in front of the x and the number behind the x to tell us some specific information. One of these is called the slope, and one of these numbers is called the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is where the line crosses the y-axis. So usually this y-intercept is uh, represented by the letter b. The general equation is y equals mx plus b. And the letter b, not sure why they chose that letter. That has nothing to do with the word y-intercept. Usually it has to do with the word. But for some reason, they chose the letter b. And that always relates to the y-intercept. So the number behind the x is the y-intercept. So even though it's the last number on the list, it's going to be the first one we put on the graph. The y-intercept we put on the y-axis and we just put it at the negative one on the y-axis. And sometimes these will be all labeled out with actual numbers. I just didn't want to take the time to do it because it's super time consuming. So then the slope is how much the line tilts. And it always needs to be a fraction. So this one is represented by the letter M. Again, I'm not sure why they chose that letter since M has nothing to do with the word slope, but it's the same letter we use in all math classes. So M is the number in front of X. It's not the three with the X. We only care about the three itself. So M is three, but we have a problem. It's not a fraction yet. To make any number a fraction, we can always put it over 1. The reason we can do that is because 3 divided by 1 is still 3. We didn't really change the number. We didn't, you know, if you divide by 2, 3 divided by 2 is the number 1.5. It changes it. If you divide it by 1, we really still have 3. So once you know that slope, it tells you a direction to count. Instead of finding coordinates using a table, what we're going to do is count up. The top of the fraction tells you to either go up or down. Positive is up. Negative is down. And the bottom of the fraction always tells you to go right. So from our y-intercept, not from the center. When you have a coordinate, you count from the center. When we have the slope, we're going to count up three spaces. So the starting spot is not a space. I don't say one, two, three. I say I make a movement, that's one space. Make another one, two. Make another one, that's three. And then write one space, and there's a coordinate. And you can keep doing that as much as you want to get an accurate graph. One, two, three, over one. If I had more, I could go up three over one again. But once you have some points, now you can graph your line. So there's one last way to graph a line, and that's with a graphing calculator. Again, you may have a separate handheld one, but probably not. not not a lot of people have a handheld graphing calculator, but there is a great website that I really like to use called desmos.com. I don't know why they chose desmos, 
kind of weird, a weird word, but you just go to desmos.com and start graphing. And you can just type the equation in. Y equals 3X minus one. So you can type it in, or if you don't have a great keyboard, they have a little button down here that will bring up a keyboard and you can click to put it in, but it'll just pop up the line for you. It even shows you important points on the line. Here is that Y intercept, because we're crossing the Y axis. Here is that X intercept, which we hadn't talked about before. Um, it's not something we use to plot the graph by hand, but it's still an important point. So you can also identify the X intercept and you can zoom in and out if you want to see more or you want to go closer. And if you're ever kind of in a weird spot, you can always hit home to get back to normal. You can even graph more than one thing at a time. Let's say we have negative one half, which if you have a fraction, you have to hit the divide button to make it a fraction. And then you have to click to the right to not be part of that fraction anymore. So negative one half X plus five. You can plot that as well. And notice this time I didn't use Y equals. It will work without Y equals and it will work with the Y equals. It's not gonna change anything if I type Y equals that in front. So it also tells you your key points, your Y intercept, or I'm gonna have to drag a little bit over. If you click and drag, then you can see more parts. So there's our X intercept and our Y intercept. If you have more than one line, it'll show you where they're crossing. This desmos.com is a great resource. Um, if you've plotted something by hand and you're like, I'm not sure I did this right, you can always check using the graphing calculator. Um, and for our courses, the so math courses at least, you can use this online graphing calculator. I know it says you can't go to another page, um, but I am fine if you use this or if you have a handheld graphing calculator. So any other questions from your courses? Those are all the topics I had prepared today. So if we don't have any questions, we'll end here today. But I just want to double check and make sure we covered everything you wanted to see. Or if you have any questions about how you take your final exam, um, when things are due, I'm happy to answer any of those types of questions as well. give you guys a second. I know sometimes chatting the questions can take a little bit. So I'm not seeing any questions. Hopefully you guys are doing great in your classes. If you do end up having some questions, you can send me a chat message. Um, if I'm not your math teacher, you can chat your math teacher or send them an email. Um, if you do have a question and I'm not your math teacher, you can email me at april.barton at graduationalliance.com. Um, but I'm happy to qu ask or sorry, answer, happy to answer questions anytime, um, even if you're not in my math class specifically. So thanks for showing up today. It's every week at the same time. We'll have it again next week at 12.30 Utah time, which depends on what state you're in, 2.30 Ohio or Michigan, or 11.30 if you're in Washington. Um, so hopefully I'll see you guys again next week and ask me questions anytime as you're going through your courses. Have a great day.